melody. Wikipedia defines melody as a succession of musical tones perceived as a single entity. And uh, that sounds good to me. Uh, my name is Tony Kniff. I'm on Manhattan's Upper West Side, where my recording studio is. That's where I am now. Uh, when the uh, organizers of this songwriting camp asked me to speak about something, I asked to talk about melody. Um, I think melody is, in a lot of ways, the most underserved part of songwriting. I write songs myself, of course, and I also work with a lot of different songwriters. And uh, often, uh, lyrics can be re rewritten 20 times. Uh, there can be different structural changes, there can be chordal changes, but melodies are often taken as this is the way it came, there's nothing I can really do about it. And if there's one thing I'd love for you to take away is that there is something, things that can be done to make melodies better. I think melody more than any other part of songwriting is, is what brings the emotion. Uh, the lyrics make us think, uh, the rhythm makes us feel in our bodies, and the melody is what touches our heart. And uh, as the great lyricist Yip Harburg said a long time ago, a song makes you feel a thought. To me, uh, a good melody tells a story without words. Uh, in other words, I don't want to depend upon just the words to tell a story. A melody needs to tell its own story. And I'm just going to try to demonstrate a relatively simple way to look at that, which is uh, kind of a fairly typical four or eight bar form and a way of shaping a melody. Now, one of the things I really go by with melodies is to try to think in paragraphs and not sentences. So what I mean by that is that uh, to try to make a longer thought of a melody. Often melodies, I think, are too modular. They tend to be the same thing and it gets repeated and it gets repeated in the same way too many times. Uh, I think if we think about the melody as a longer phrase, an eight bar phrase or whatever it might be, 12 bars or six bars or whatever your song might have, uh, is a better way to think about it. So, a very common way to think about a melody is that there's a statement of a main theme. Uh, it's restated with variations. Uh, then there's a main variation. The greatest variation is the third part. And, uh, and then you restate the theme. Now, I'm not in any way trying to tell you a formula or rule or anything like that, but just pretty common in thousands of songs. I'm going to give you a demonstration of that. Uh, it doesn't exactly follow the form famous song, Smoke on the Water. Theme, variation, restatement of the theme with a resolution. So, it's classic. Um, another example, Paul McCartney's song, Yesterday. You think about it, yesterday, main theme. All my troubles seem so far away, variation. Now it looks as though they're here to stay. And then the resolution, oh, I believe in yesterday. So that's another classic example, kind of a four-part idea, in the case of Smoke on the Water, more a three-part idea, of theme, theme with variations, maybe another variation, and then a resolution. That's a paragraph, not a sentence. So if a melody is an arrangement of pitches in sequence, uh, there's a way I like to think about that that's not that technical, but it, it's actually pretty good categories, which is you can separate them into three ways of moving pitches. One is uh, by steps, which means up and down a scale, not more than a jump of a third. Uh, and then repeated notes, which are simply that, just notes, the notes that get repeated. And then there are leaps, which are jumps up or down of a fourth or more. Um, and uh, a good melody will usually mix those elements in some way. Now, we talked about yesterday. Uh, yesterday is an example of a melody that moves mostly in steps. Da 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 So it's kind of just moving up and down a scale with a couple of pauses. And actually those pauses involve repeated notes because it goes yesterday, so today, that's, those are repeated notes. So that's an example of how you have repeated notes. 
Uh, there's not much, there's only one leap in yesterday. It's not that important. But leaps are really interesting because uh, where the melody jumps is really where the feeling comes in. Like some of the most powerfully emotional parts of songs, melodies, come when there are leaps either up or down. And I'll give you a couple of examples uh, of leaps up, Somewhere Over the Rainbow, uh, which is a famous you know, jump of an octave, Somewhere Over the Rainbow, or Starman, David Bowie's song. Um, and then there's uh, uh, Somewhere from West Side Story, uh, where it goes, there's a place for us. So that's a jump of a flat seven. Uh, again, really powerful. Uh, Dreams will inspire you. Do, 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 do. That's uh, Empire State of Mind, of course, and that's a jump of a fifth. So you can really feel the emotion in that. You don't want to overdo that unless you're really great at it. But definitely mixing in leaps, particularly at really critical parts of the melody, can be so effective and so powerful emotionally. Um, exa an example of a, of a leap down would be Roxanne by Sting by the police. Roxanne, going down a fourth. Um, and another writer that I recommend you look into just in general, but uh, particularly his great stuff from the 60s is Brian Wilson, something like God Only Knows, which are, is filled with leaps and jumps that are unexpected and really powerful. Um, so that's a way that you can start thinking about uh, varying your melodies. Let's talk about melody in contemporary songwriting. Uh, it's more important than ever. And why is that? Well, a big part of the reason is that uh, harmonically pop songs tend to be much simpler now. A lot of them are four bar patterns. They're very loop based. There's not a lot of variation going on harmonically. So the melody really has to carry a lot more weight than it used to. And the pacing of melody has really changed. Um, the audience is very sophisticated. They've heard a million songs and they kind of know what to expect. So usually songs are much more, melodies rather, are much more active now. Uh, they tend to have uh, a lot of syncopation. They tend to go, go across bar lines. Uh, there's a lot of inner rhymes, very musical inner rhymes in the lyrics. Uh, and more than anything else, there's very few pauses. The melodies just keep flowing. Uh, it's basically like uh, rapping, but with notes. Uh, the kind of rhythmic intricacies of rap have been combined with melodic pop songwriting, and that's what you get in a lot of contemporary pop writing. A lot of us songwriters have a tendency to stay in the same scale for a section of the song or even for the whole song. Sometimes that can be fine. Some songs work diatonically some, or in their mode. Uh, some of them work with a blues scale or other kinds of scales, but also sometimes it can be really good to mix in a note or two that are, that's out of the scale uh, in a song. It really can add kind of a spice and a flavor to the melody that you can't get in any other way. And I would even say that in some melodies it's almost called for, or I was going to say a necessity, but maybe not a necessity, but it's called for because the melody could be kind of bland without it. And to give you a good example that most people don't think of this way, I'm going to take the song Do Re Mi by Richard Rodgers and Oscar Hammerstein, one of the most famous songs ever written. Um, and it's a song that's literally about the major scale. The lyrics are about the major scale, and it goes, you know, it's about Do Re Mi Fa Sol La Ti Do. But even in that song, Richard Rodgers was a canny enough songwriter to realize that if he stayed in the major scale, or in this case on the white keys, because we're going to play it in C major, that it would just be too boring. So let's take a look at what he does to, uh, you know, kind of keep things a little more interesting. Uh, so he starts out, and again, everyone knows this melody, he starts out first degree of the scale, second, re. So he follows this pattern, all white keys. Then the fifth. Now he's going to mix in an F sharp. Now he's going to mix in a G sharp. 
and then back to the white keys. So even in a song that's about the major scale, he realized that mixing in some other notes would really be useful. And it is really useful sometimes. And it's something that I, sometimes it's, it's not a complicated thing to do, but it's easily forgotten about and easily ignored. So consider it, keep it in mind. Every week I write a songwriting blog post for my website, www.tonyconniff.com. Uh, and um, there's one post that I've written that it's maybe three, four years old now that's still the most popular, it has the most hits I've ever gotten, and it still gets hits every day. And that's the one that's about, did I steal my melody from another song? So a lot of people are Googling that and they come and they look at it. So it's, it's something that many, if not most songwriters think about and, and also worry about. Uh, and what the problem with that is that that can sometimes cause what I call copy fear. In other words, a, and what, how would I define copy fear? Uh, you know, a, a crippling fear of uh, stealing someone else's melody that actually stops you from writing. Um, it doesn't happen so much with lyrics, which is kind of interesting. And I wonder if that's not because lyrics actually get rewritten more than melodies, but that kind of goes back into that topic. Um, but anyway, what happens for me is uh, I often get inspired by other songs. You know, I hear something and I go, oh, I want to write something like that. Or I hear a, a melody or a groove and I kind of run over to my guitar. And um, what happens is that by the time I've copied it, to be blunt about it, it doesn't sound anything like the thing that I was copying. Um, and uh, it always changes. The melody in particular always changes. And for actually for something to be plagiarism, it has to be kind of exactly the same, which really isn't easy. Uh, for example, in, uh, if you have a sequence of nine notes in an octave, there are over five billion possibilities of melodies. So it's actually much harder than you might think to copy someone else's melody. So, uh, you know, my approach, my theory is that, uh, is to just go ahead and write. Don't worry about if you're stealing it from somebody else. Uh, try to write without copy fear. Let's say you write 20 songs, 19 out of 20 are gonna be fine. The 20th, maybe it sounds a little bit like something. You'll change a note or two. Or even if you have to throw it out, you've still got the other 19. But if you are crippled by copy fear, you're not going to write the, the other 19. So try not to worry about stealing your melody from somebody else. Everybody worries about it, and usually it doesn't happen. One thing you want to avoid, uh, and um, particularly speaking to you guitarists out there, um, is what I call the one chord, one note song. In other words, the melody changes when the chord changes. It's really boring. Um, and it's easy when you're kind of strumming the guitar, particularly to kind of fall into something like that. Uh, you, I think having the melody, it's got to be connected to the chords, but not be controlled by the chords. And it's easy to have them be controlled by the chords when you're really into kind of strumming or, you know, banging them out on the piano or something like that. Um, another thing to think about is watch out for uh, landing on the root note too often while the melody is still moving. Uh, so if we're thinking about the melody, as we talked about before, that's a story in itself, forget about the words, but just the melody is a story in and of itself that has a drama to it, um, that when you land on the root note of the chord in the melody too often, you lose some of that drama because basically the drama is resolved. You're back home at the root note. So for example, let's say you have something like a Melodies, da, 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 da. so you got da, 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 da. okay. Now in the first phrase, you've landed back at the root note, 
So you're back home already, which is probably not where you want to be. In other words, you want to create a little bit of dramatic tension or maybe even a lot of dramatic tension before you resolve and you come back home, if you ever do. So what about if it's something like da 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 if that's the first phrase. Just the last note goes up to the third instead of coming down to the root. Da 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 da. So that feels like it hasn't finished. It's still in motion, it's going somewhere, something else is going to happen. And you lose that when you land on the root too often. So that's something to really be careful about. Um, as long as we're talking about that too, um, another thing I like to think about with melodies is, for example, I might write that melody of da 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 da. So I'm writing da 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 da. Then I realize, oh, okay, I'm landing back on the root. It's not really doing what I want it to do. So something really useful is to move it up one inversion. So instead of going, now I'm, I'm doing on the scale one, two, three, two, one. What if I go up a third and I go three, four, five, four, three. So I go da 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 da. So that's my first phrase. Da 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 da. Maybe that's more interesting. I'm not saying it's always going to be, but thinking sometimes I find that I I write in the wrong inversion that I start on one, but really what's a better uh, version of that is a, an inversion. And I could maybe even go starting on the fifth. Da, 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 using the flat seven. Da, 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 da. With the seventh. Da, 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 da. Or even the major seventh. Da, 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 da. Da, 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 da. So remember, I started with da 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 da, and then I tried da 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 da, and then I tried da 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 da, or da da da. Sorry, da 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 da. I'm a bad guitar player, but so those are really simple things of just moving up, starting the melody a third higher. You get a whole different look at it, and sometimes it really works better. Some more thoughts about how a melody can be improved. Um, one thing I find really useful is to play the melody by itself on an instrument. So at a point where I feel like the melody has taken a pretty good shape and maybe the song is kind of well along to completion, at some point I'll just play it, play the melody on the guitar. Uh, remember this? No, not that, anything but that. But So I just listen to it by itself just as a melody. That can be really revealing because as I kind of pointed out a few minutes ago, sometimes just banging away on the guitar or on the piano can uh, cover up a flaw or a problem in the melody. And you know, it's quite often that I play it by itself and I go, oh, that's not moving the way I want it to or it's really kind of boring and I want it to kind of stand up and be powerful on its own as a melody. Um, so playing it on an instrument, even playing it on a different instrument is really useful. Like I play it on guitar and then I'm a bass player, so then I'll play it along with just the bass notes, which I think is really, really useful to not have the chords and just have it be a cappella, have it be just on a guitar, have it be sung with just bass, just the bass notes, because then I'm really hearing uh, how the no, melody notes go with the root of the chord, which is really the main thing I believe that we really hear, you know, in the harmonically. Um, another thing to think about is accelerating the rhythm, uh, a really good uh, of the melody, and a really good um, uh, example of doing this is uh, is how Adele does it in a couple of her hit songs. If you think about like um, uh, her her song "Rolling in the Deep," where uh, you know the the verse is pretty methodical, but when it gets to the pre-chorus, it goes, the scars of your love remind me of it. And she does exactly the same thing in some, Someone Like You. Um, uh, Hope you be reminded. Da, 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 da. So she accelerates her melody, which builds up tension, which takes us into the, uh, into the chorus really powerfully in both of those songs in a very similar way. Um, so changing up the pacing of the melody, you know, going from mixing eighth notes and quarter notes to mixing eighth notes and sixteenth notes or vice versa, something like that. 
Um, another really useful thing to think about, and I find a lot of songwriters tend to write songs that have uh, where the lengths of each line, either melody or lyric, are the same. So they become very predictable and kind of samey. And if you look at and listen to most great songs, that's not the case with those songs. Usually the, the phrases are kind of uneven. You know, to go back to yesterday, we think yesterday, all my troubles seem so far away. Now it looks as though they're here to stay. Oh, I believe in yesterday. Or, you know, somewhere over the rainbow. Somewhere over the rainbow, sky uh, way up high, birds fly over the rainbow. Why then, oh, why can't I? Um, you know, it's not, it's not just da 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 Or uh, Lose Yourself by Eminem, one of the greatest lyrics ever written. Uh, you know, his palms are sweaty, knees weak, arms are heavy, there's vomit on his, on his sweater already, mom's spaghetti, he's nervous, but on the surface he looks calm and ready. You know, every phrase is a little bit different. Um, you see that a lot in Burt Bacharach songs, you see it in Lennon McCartney songs, a lot of great songs. Uh, so generally speaking, if you're looking at your lyric or you're listening to your melody and you're hearing phrases of the same length one after the other, that's something you really might want to take a look at. Uh, another thing I like to think about too is dropping either a bar or two beats or a beat um, from the phrase. So uh, this would affect the whole song, of course, not just the melody. Um, so having, instead of being a four bar phrase or an eight bar phrase, it'd be a three and a half bar phrase or a seven bar phrase. Uh, some songs that do this really effectively are Hey Ya by Outkast, uh, All You Need Is Love by The Beatles. Also, uh, I Say a Little Prayer by uh, Burt Bacharach and Hal David. Uh, they have these little twists and turns uh, where beats or bars are dropped and so things kind of happen in surprising ways. Uh, another thing I like to think about, and I've been doing this more lately, is when I kind of have my melody laid out, I want to match the words to it, but sometimes the words, when they don't fit, if I have a good uh, phrase of words, I will sometimes change the melody to fit the words, because that will make me write a melody that's a little bit unpredictable for me. It'll take me out of my comfort zone and kind of let the words lead the way, because I tend to let the melody lead the way. But sometimes the words can take the melody in a really interesting direction. Let's talk about harmonizing a melody. Now, you don't have to know music theory to, uh, to harmonize a melody, to put chords to it. Um, knowing music theory gives you some options, which I'll get into. But basically, uh, you're just searching for the right sound. You're searching for the right sound that underpins your melody. I kind of look at harmonizing a melody uh, a little bit like uh, the way a film score works, that the, the music in a film usually is kind of guiding you in how the filmmaker wants you to feel about what's going on in the scene emotionally. Similarly, by putting different chords under a melody, you create uh, you know, different underpinnings emotionally for how, what the melody and what the words mean. It's always important though to keep in mind that about the melody and the words. Um, so to, to demonstrate this, I just picked a, a very simple melody of just going G and D. Da 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 da, da 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 da. And now I'm gonna use a little bit of music theory to give myself some options of how to harmonize this. Now I could just stay on a G chord because the G is the root and the D is the fifth of a G chord. Da 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 Or I could go G to D along, just move the chords along with the melody, thereby violating what I said before about don't put the root in the melody all the time. But here's what it sounds like. Da 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 What if instead of playing the D chord, I play a B minor chord? So I'm singing the D, but I'm playing a B minor, so the D is the minor third of the B minor. Da 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 Or I could play uh, G to E minor. So the D would then be the seventh of the E minor seventh chord. Da 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 Da, 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 da. 
or I could make that D the suspended fourth of an A suspended fourth chord, A7 sus4. Da -da -da -da. I could change the first chord to an E minor, for example, da, 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 to a B minor. Da, 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 da. Da, 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 da. Or I could go C to B minor, or C to E minor, say. Da, 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 da. I could move all of the chords around. I could go G minor, no, I'm sorry, G to B minor to E minor to D, for example. Or I could turn it around and go E minor to C. So therefore the E minor, the G is the minor third of the E minor, and then the D is the nine of the C chord. You know, on and on and on. The key thing to me is a little knowledge can be a dangerous thing here. And uh, if I'm messing around with different harmonies, I really want to be careful that I don't kind of try to be clever for its own sake and get away from what's going on emotionally in the lyric, what's going on emotionally in the melody, and what the song is really about, because everything needs to serve that and not kind of just be, you know, clever songwriting or some kind of show offy thing. A few things in closing. Uh, this is an assignment that I've given in songwriting workshops uh, that's really interesting, which is to write a melody without an instrument, without using an instrument and also uh, without using words, just use sounds. So la la, sha sha, na na, anything you want that's a sound that doesn't have a meaning as a word, uh, and just write a melody all on its own. Try to keep to a structure, just write it the way you'd write a song, but it's just a melody with sounds. I think you'll find it really interesting. Another suggestion I have is to really pay attention to and study the melodies of the great melody writers. Um, some examples, uh, Richard Rogers, Jerome Kern, Brian Wilson, Stevie Wonder, uh, Billy Joel, Elton John, Lennon and McCartney, Marvin Gaye, Joni Mitchell, uh, Laura Nero, Max Martin. Um, you'll start to really notice that one thing they all have in common is great melodies, that you really don't get to be a great songwriter without writing great melodies. Um, and uh, I'll leave you with this final thought too, which is uh, when in doubt, follow the melody. So thanks a lot for watching and listening, and uh, I hope we get a chance to meet one of these days. Bye now.